Good morning, guys. This is Brian from the Concrete Confessional Addiction and Recovery blog, also known as Neuromantic or the Neuromancer here on YouTube. I am a science teacher. I teach high school biology and chemistry. I'm also a med school flunky. I dropped out. And for the past 15 plus years, I've been addicted to benzos and opioids, both in the U.S. and abroad. So today I'm going to talk about fentanyl versus heroin, and I'm going to talk about what being addicted to those two substances, what the subjective experiences of those addictions are like. Now, I have been addicted to both. When I got into opioids when I was 15 or 16, um, it was on the East Coast. I grew up in upstate New York, and this was around 2005, 2006, and it was all East Coast high purity powder heroin that you could snort or that you could inject without adding acid and heating it to break it down. So it was all heroin for the first few years of my illicit opioid addiction in the US. By the time that I graduated from college and then a couple years later, I had been trying to get clean unsuccessfully. And so for the next several years, I was kind of in and out of sobriety. And I would say around like 2014, 2015 is when fentanyl entered the U.S. drug supply. People started dropping like flies. The number of friends I lost during like a two to three year period was abominable because the dealers hadn't found out how to cut this stuff properly yet properly yet and also no one's system was used to this higher quantity of a stronger opioid so number of friends i lost during those years when fent first came into the u.s illicit opioid supply was deplorable and i will never forget those years so long story short i have lived both and uh, i left the u.s around 2018 moved to mainland china and at that point i was clean for a while and then I relapsed into prescription opioids. So came back to the US during the pandemic and unfortunately have relapsed a couple of times and sampled the absolute garbage, which a lot of the time it's not even fentanyl. It's things like Trank, which I'll, I'll touch on briefly later in the video, but I don't want to get too ahead of myself. So long story short, I have lived both fentanyl and heroin addiction, and this video is to talk about those chemicals and about what sort of makes them different and how that impacts your daily life as an addicted user. Now, and I really mean this, this is not just a disclaimer for YouTube purposes, like I really mean, if you are thinking of trying illicit opioids or even trying to get high on prescription opioids today, it is probably the worst decision you can make for your life. These drugs are, according to the percentage of people who try them who get addicted to them, some of the most addictive drugs on the planet, they are also some of the hardest to get off of. Once they have their hooks in you, they create this really physiologic addiction that not too many people escape from even with the help of things like opioid maintenance don't do it worst thing you can do if you want to try chemicals and you are hell bent on it i can give you a list of a dozen chemicals i would experiment with before i would try opioids so disclaimer over just don't do it before i sound like uh, nancy reagan there but all right so first thing i want to talk about are the chemical structures okay so heroin as bad of a rap as it has, it's essentially morphine. It's morphine with two acetyl groups added onto it. Those acetyl groups give it a little bit more fat solubility, which means that it moves through the blood brain barrier a little bit faster. But, you know, we like to feel good, but it's, it's essentially just morphine by the time it's acting on your system. And morphine, for those of you who don't know, it's found naturally in the opium poppy, the poppy plant, you know, it's found in opium, I mean. Um, and it is one of the three alkaloids in the plant that are psychoactive. So they're morphine, codeine, and thebane, okay? So heroin is essentially just morphine, even though it has this like awful rap as a street drug that in my opinion, it really doesn't deserve. Fentanyl is fully synthetic. You'll see in the chemical structures there that it has an entirely different structure. And even though they both bind to the mu opioid receptor and exert their action there, they produce euphoria, they release dopamine and those midbrain pleasure centers that you hear about, like the nucleus accumbens and the locus ceruleus. They have very different properties because uh, the manner in which they stimulate the receptor and, and the way in which they sort of like uh, persist in the body is very different. So that's what I want to touch on next. So the, the, the big difference, like if you only remember one thing about the difference between fentanyl and heroin is that fentanyl is a heck of a lot more potent. Okay, what that means is that whereas you need like 
you know, if you're going to snort these drugs and you're doing heroin, you're going to have like a line that's, you know, an inch and a half, two inches long, a fairly thick powder in front of you. With fentanyl, even after it's been cut, which is very unreliable because street chemists are doing this, you're, you're going to have like this tiny little bit of powder that looks like you spilled a, like a very small amount of flour or sugar while you're baking. Okay, so fentanyl is a high potency opioid and even if it's given at the right dosage there's a reason why it's used surgically it comes on really heavy hard and heavy and there's not a lot of gray area between like okay i'm feeling the euphoria i'm feeling the good effects and like okay i'm slumped over barely conscious so these days in the streets you see people who are literally bent over double high on fentanyl and that was something you you would see people nodding off on heroin but almost never to that degree of almost anesthetized unconsciousness that sometimes has to do with what the fent is being cut with now things like trank which is xylazine and animal tranquilizer but a lot of times it's just a combination of exhaustion plus fentanyl that gives like again this almost anesthetized state so fentanyl is super potent it binds to that mu opioid receptor with a really high affinity it's uh, hard to dissociate from the receptor it's just very potent in its action and because of that hard to reverse fentanyl overdoses. So again, I was around during the sort of glory days of heroin actually being heroin. People did overdose then. People did die then. But it was always usually one of two scenarios. One was they were someone who weren't particularly familiar with opiates, usually who injected it, often under the influence of alcohol or benzos or another downer. So that was one scenario. The other scenario was people would think that someone who they knew was high was asleep and that person would sort of drift off over the course of like you know three to five hours they would turn blue and someone would go to check on them hours later and realize that they had died it was almost never an instantaneous complete overdose in the case of someone who has actually experienced with opioids and that really changed with fentanyl you know fentanyl is like a chemical russian roulette i have seen people inject fentanyl and, and go down like it, it the sounds they were making it sounded like their lungs stopped instantaneously so again you don't have that time to realize that something's wrong you don't have that time to get the narcan or get the emts there with fentanyl that respiratory depression like all of the other effects with with fentanyl it, it kicks in really quickly and really severely and because of that it's hard to reverse the overdose again it goes back to fentanyl binding at the mu opioid receptor really tightly narcan naloxone the antagonist that you give to reverse opioid um, overdose it also has a high affinity but it's it's trying to outcompete the fentanyl and so you got to get that narcan concentration higher before that starts to happen and you got to give it a little time for the narcan to get more chances to bind to that receptor so what that means is that someone can die in the interim whereas with heroin if you'd given narcan it was very efficient at getting into those receptors and making sure that they were turned off with fentanyl it's a lot more uh, dicey whether the narcan is going to be effective you often need to give more than one hit of Narcan and again get that concentration up higher so that it can outcompete the remaining fentanyl at that mu opioid receptor. What this also means uh, the combination of the high potency, the strong affinity, and the fact that you just, you know, because of that need a tiny little amount of it is that it's much more dangerous. People who aren't trying to take this drug can be exposed to it and really hurt by that, okay? So there was recently this big drug raid in my hometown of Syracuse, New York at this notorious set of projects called Parkside Commons. And one of the ways that the, the cops knew to check this place out was that in the past year, I think, there had been two overdoses of very young people, like babies or toddlers in that building. So you can imagine you're like three or four, you're wandering around, putting your hands on everything, and then you're eating a snack afterward. Fentanyl is strong enough that if you have no opioid tolerance, let alone if you're a you know, little person, you get some on your hand, it gets onto your food and you eat it, that can be a fatal overdose for a young person. So this potency of fentanyl means that it's very unsuitable as a street drug. It's actually the opposite of what you would want in a street opioid. And because of that, it's just, it's so much more dangerous. It's so much more likely that you and even people who aren't trying to use fentanyl are going to overdose on it.
So the next thing I want to talk about is that fentanyl is much shorter acting than heroin. So fentanyl, if it's given in a single IV dose, is really only effective for like maximum of 60 to 90 minutes. That's as opposed to a few hours, like at least four to six hours for something like heroin. Because of this, this is why I call fentanyl the crack of the opioids. You know, you have to keep redosing and redosing and redosing. And like I said, because of the high potency, you're either, you know, at 60 miles per hour or zero miles per hour. There's never that gray functional area in between. So, you know, I lived my last two years of college at Cornell, I was on heroin all the time. It was of pretty consistent quality. You know, it was being brought in ultimately from the Middle East and the chemists along the way knew what they were doing. And because of that, I shot it up like two to three times a day, absolutely like clockwork. I knew how much to take to be functional, how much to take when it was night and I was ready to go to sleep. And it was an addiction that you could live a life on. It, it really was. You were, you know, again, you were high for maybe three to five hours and then you still had that buffer of a few more hours before you got really sick. So that was heroin addiction. Fentanyl addiction, totally different story. You can be high as a kite, like just totally unconsciously high now. And in 90 minutes, you're going to be so sick that you're going out doing desperate things to get high again. So that that half life is everything, you know, and with this is sort of a chemical um, side note, but with a lot of classes of drugs, you see that the most addictive ones have the moderately long half lives. And it, it's Partly that that is a sort of the comfort zone as a user, you know, but it's partly that if, if the half-life is too short, it just creates this like brutal need to redose that burns people out and leads them to do desperate things that ultimately might actually get them out of the addiction, although that's a different story. So fentanyl being so short acting, in fact, fentanyl and its analogs are like the shortest acting of the commonly used opioids really means that it's difficult to live life as a user. Again, it's like the crack of the opioids. Okay, so the other thing I want to talk about is price. Okay, so heroin was very steady at $80 to $100 a bundle. A bundle is a set of 10 bags, if you guys don't know that. So that was the price from the time I started it again in like 20, 2005 to the time that I stopped, um, or to the time when fentanyl really came into the drug supply in like 2014, 2015. So unless you were buying a, a lot of bundles, that was going to be the price. So if you had, you know, 40 to 50 bucks a day, you weren't going to be sick and you were going to be feeling okay. Now, yes, that's a lot of money. It's a lot of stress to come up with that much money consistently. But, you know, there was also buprenorphine floating around by then. And there, there were ways to get yourself by when you didn't have that much money. Now, a combination of things changed the prices of illicit opioids being sold as dope in the U.S. The first was the fact that Fent is so much more potent and it doesn't actually have to come and be processed from raw opium from the poppy. And because of that, it, it's a, a lot higher overhead. So for every kilogram of fent that's being brought in through the border into the U.S., the profit margin is a lot higher and dealers can afford to sell it for a bit more, you know, a bit cheaper. So that's one factor. The other factor is that during the pandemic, the supply became very scarce at the same time when those stimulus checks gave a lot of drug addicts who wouldn't normally have a couple thousand to spend a couple thousand to spend. Now, because of that, the combination of those two influences meant that, you know, it, it was being cut much more, um, it was being diluted a lot more, and it was being sold much more cheaply. Okay, so the price of a bun, again, 10 bags in the US right now is steady, right around 20 bucks in my hometown, even if you're just buying one. So that is incredibly cheap. It sounds like it would be a lot easier to be an opioid addict now. And it really isn't again, because that chemical wears off so quickly it's so potent so you become so severely physiologically addicted to it so early on and you really end up needing like at least 60 to 80 bucks a day in order to get three to four bundles to keep yourself you know out of sickness and feeling okay so what happened with price was not the relief that you think it would be is what i'm getting at with that okay so basically fentanyl is much more potent than heroin it lasts a much shorter time, and in the U.S. right now, it's a lot cheaper. My my very short conclusion is that, 
You don't want to become addicted to any opioid, but if you have to become addicted to an opioid, I would give heroin about four out of five stars, and I would give fentanyl, you know, 0.25 out of five stars. Like, it's that bad. It is really not the opioid you would want to use if you had your, your choice in the matter. The reason why this all matters is that there's a lot of talk about fentanyl being seized at the border and the crackdown on fentanyl in the U.S. these days. Our, our Attorney General um, uh, Pam Bondi recently claimed to have saved, like I think it was like 200 million people with the fentanyl that they had seized at the border, which is, of course, a ridiculous, idiotic overstatement. But even if they crack down on fentanyl really severely and really successfully, it's not going to solve the problems we have in the U.S. Two things are going to happen. One is that things like Trank, that veterinary tranquilizer that I met mentioned earlier, which is called its chemical name is xylazine, that is going to be used as more and more of the cut, and that is a terrible drug that causes skin lesions that have led to a, a statistically significant rise in amputations all throughout the U.S. This is a really bad drug that is not even that euphoric or pleasurable okay so that's one thing that's going to happen and the other thing that's going to happen is dealers are going to have to find new opioids now i think that the next set of opioids that comes into popularity is going to be the benzamidazole opioids also called the nitazines or the frankenstein opioids so these are another group of opioids that are fully synthetic they are available readily on the dark web right now and their potency ranges from like about equipotent to morphine or heroin to many times more potent even than fentanyl which is so scary because as a dealer again you know which of those two chemicals you're going to choose you're going to choose a much more potent one because you are going to get much more bang for your uh not buck but bang for your volume in moving it in right so those drugs are going to be even harder to control they're going to be comparable in potency to something like car fentanyl which we found in our drug supply that that thing that's used to uh, to sedate a t-rex in jurassic park you know those are going to be the opioids that are turned to next some of the nitazines have been scheduled in some of the u.s but it doesn't really matter if they're all scheduled all of a sudden um the way that people are getting nitazines is a little bit more diffuse um, again a lot of it is happening through the dark web so it's really hard to crack down on and the point is like as long as the demand is there and the demand is so high it's going to be filled and what we've seen you know i have lived through everyone being addicted to prescription oxycodone that was cracked down on so everyone became addicted to illicit heroin that was cracked down on so everyone became addicted to illicit fentanyl that's cracked down on so now we're getting trank and we're just starting to see the rise of the nitazines and it hasn't helped it's made everyone involved more desperate it's criminalized a medical problem it has just caused chaos in our country so we need to keep shifting people who aren't ready to get completely clean on a maintenance and buprenorphine and methadone that is one thing that's being done better but i think that we really need to focus on the wider mental health conversation like we have a mental health epidemic in the u.s right now and you can't treat addiction as an isolated problem it's a symptom you know we need to work on forging community as, as sort of cliche as that sounds it's the truth we need to work on figuring out why people are so stressed, why the U.S. is so unlivable right now for the working and middle class. The U.S. is a wonderful country to live in if you are in the top, you know, one to three percent, but it has never been so hard to live in if you are just like an average person. And if we don't fix that, we're going to get more and more deaths of despair. We're going to get more addiction. And it doesn't matter how crappy the stuff on the streets is. People are still going to turn to it because they just need some little bit of relief. So we've got to make life good enough and community is strong enough that that little bit of relief isn't so enticing because people aren't so damn stressed out. So that is my little PSA for this morning. I hope you found this, uh, this video enjoyable and I've got a lot of other content on my channel already and coming. So like, subscribe, comment, and if you have any questions, I will be glad to answer them in the comments. So hope everybody has a good day and I will see you next time.